Now that we've learned about the student processing unit, the SPU, its operating environment, and its assembler, uh, and we've looked at how to write Hello World in that assembler, we can start learning about writing larger programs. But to do that, we need to understand how to put in all the typical control flow structures that we would use in our high-level languages into the SPU assembler. So we're going to cover each of these one by one uh, and talk about how we convert a simple piece of C or C++ code into its equivalent assembler, and then we'll look at any interesting caveats along the way. To get started, let's look at the simplest of these control flow structures, and that's an if statement that doesn't have an else associated with it. So typically when we look at something like this, and I've got a, a simple one over here, we're saying if dog is less than cat, then increment dog. Now, uh, because of the way we speak this in English, we get um, confused often as we start assembly language programming because what we think this does is it compares dog to cat, and if dog is less than cat, then it's going to jump down here and run this code. Uh, but the reality is what this, this does is it checks to see if dog is less than cat, and if it is not, it skips past the code that increments dog. It never really goes to this code actively. That code is just sort of the next thing that you would run. So you're doing the comparisons in the if statement, and unless the comparison fails, then you're going to fall down to the next stuff, which is the increment of dog. At least that's how it works in assembly language. So that's what you're going to see here on the code to the right. Now, there is another little caveat about, caveat about this code on the right, and that's that we're using low memory variables. So we're assuming dog and cat are in the bottom 256 addresses, 0, hex, 2, ff, hex. The reason for that is because the load and store instructions can uh, take two parameters, which we see being used here, the target or destination register, and an immediate 8-bit address for uh, the location of memory from which to copy into the register. So uh, if we didn't have these variables in those bottom 256 memory locations, we couldn't address them with 8 bits. So we're going to look at how to do this with first with low memory variables, and then we'll look at how we can do this with high memory variables, meaning variables that are beyond hex ff in their memory location. So we take the variable dog uh, via its label so we don't have to know the address ourselves, uh, and then we uh, copy the contents of that memory location into A. We do the same for B. Then we do a subtract. Now that subtracts B from A, and that's the way we do comparisons. It will produce an output in the C register, which is the output of the ALU. And whenever the C register is modified, we're going to modify all the flags of the ALU, specifically the carry flag, the sign flag, and the zero flag. The zero flag, if set, means the result of the subtraction was a zero, uh, which would say that the two variables must have been equal to one another. Right? And so we can, we can get through some idea like this, all of those different conditions, equal, not equal, greater than, less than, less than equal, greater than equal. And so we have to think about which ones of those to use. So after the comparison, we can do a conditional branch. But remember, what we want to do is, if dog is not less than cat, which really means if it's greater than or equal to cat, then jump past the dog being incremented code. So here, we've done the comparison through subtraction, and we're looking at the opposite condition of less than. We're going to branch if dog is greater than or equal to cat down to this label, done, which skips over the part that does the increment. If it turns out that dog is less than cat, then the branch, the conditional branch will fail and will just naturally fall down to the next line of code. In which case, we increment the A register, which contains the value of dog, but we can't stop there. If we stop there, this would not be the same as the code on the left, because the code on the left increments dog, not some register inside uh, our CPU. So we got to take that A register that contains the incremented value of dog, and then store it back into the variable dog using the store function. Then when that's done, uh, it will naturally fall through to the same location done as we would have if we would have skipped the true part, or in other words, if the original condition had failed.
and then the code just runs like normal. If we want to do this with high memory addresses, the code becomes longer because to manipulate the high memory uh, or to use the high memory addresses, we have to load an address register with a reference to the variable. Uh, and that takes a couple instructions. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the, the address of cat and store the address of cat, not the value of cat, the address of cat into the A register. And we have to do that because it's the only way we can get something into the address register AR. Then we'll use the register copy method or instruction to copy from register A, which is the address of cat, into the address register. So that gets our pointer set up so that we can then do a load that's pointer based and that looks to the address register for the pointer to grab whatever that address points to into register B. Now immediately you should notice outside of this being three lines of code so far instead of one line of code that I didn't get dog first. In this case I did cat first and you should really wonder why. Well, the reason is uh, I have to manipulate uh, this register A to get things done. So uh, first I get cat, uh, put it, the address of cat in the address register, and then I grab B. Then I'm going to do uh, the same stuff uh, to grab dog into register A. But because I'll have, uh, I'll have done the dog second, the dog access second, the address register will still contain the address of dog when we potentially increment dog. That will allow me to more quickly uh, store the result of the increment. So I am doing these in the opposite order, but I'm still putting them in the same registers as the previous code. So set A to cat, copy the cat's address into the address register, grab whatever the address register points to into register B, and then do the same thing for dog, except into register A. So now register A contains the value of dog, register B contains the value of cat. Then the code is very similar. Subtract to do the comparison, and if dog turns out to be greater than or equal to cat, then skip past all that increment stuff and we're done. But if it isn't greater than or equal, then the original C condition must have been true, and so we need to do the increment. Since dog's value is in the A register, we can just increment A. And since dog's address is conveniently in the address register because I reorganized which order I took uh, copies of the variables from, I can just use the store based on a pointer um, instruction to take the incremented value of dog, which is an A, and store it at the memory location of dog. And then we fall through uh, to the same code, whatever is below the C if statement. Now, because using these high memory variables uh, requires us to add all these extra lines of code, for the sake of this presentation's length, from here on out, I'm only going to consider variables uh, that exist in low memory addresses. That way we can focus more on interesting caveats of the SPU assembly and, most importantly, the flow control operations themselves. So let's look at the next one. The next most advanced is an if statement that actually has an else associated with it. So we have to think through this one as well. Uh, here on the left we're saying if dog isn't equal to cat, then we want to decrement cat. Otherwise, we want to replace cat with whatever dog is but plus five. Now this code is not so difficult to understand, but you can see that the code over here uh, is quite a bit heftier than the code we were looking at before. And that's uh, not code uh, that is using uh, high address pointers. This is all low address variables. Uh, and the reason that this is so much longer is we have some more complicated things to deal with here. First, we have to really get our bearings on what's going to happen. We're going to say if this original condition holds, then we want to execute this cat minus minus stuff. Now, based on the previous slide, I'll go back. Uh, on this previous slide, we talked about how if this condition, condition fails, we want to skip past uh, what would otherwise be the true section of the if. But we're not going to do that here. Instead, when we have an else, we're going to evaluate this condition. And if it holds, 
we are going to branch to some other part of the code that won't be right after it that does the true part of the if. If this condition fails, then we're going to fall through to the code that's immediately below it in assembly, not in the C code. Uh, and that will actually be the else part, the false part of the if else. The reason for this is because when we write high level code, we are often told, uh, you know, we want, the, we want the code to be readable. So you put whatever of the two conditions, so if you've got an if with an else, whichever one, the true part or the false part, whichever one is more likely to happen, we want that to be in the true part. And the reason is because that co-locates visually this cat minus minus stuff with the actual condition that determines we decrement the cat, right? Decrement the cat. That sounds crazy. Decrement the variable cat. Uh, and this is nice for us because then when we see the condition, we understand what it's probably going to do. It's going to decrement cat. Uh, but in some circumstances, it will come down here and cat will be replaced with dog plus five. So by putting the, the most common thing in the true block of our if statement, we have more readable code. Now, if people on average write their code to be more readable, which they do, we hope, then we might also leverage this to make our code faster when we implement it in assembly language. Say, not because we're handwriting the assembly language, but because maybe we're generating the assembly language as part of a compiler. It's not going to be so often that people are handwriting assembly language. So we need to look at how that compiler can optimize the performance of this. So think about it this way. Uh, if the true part of the code, cat minus minus, was right under the original comparison and conditions, then whenever this code is done, we're going to have to run an extra instruction to skip past the else code. And that means every time we run the true, we're going to have to do the conditional comparisons and con or the comparison and conditional branch at the top of the if. But then when we ran the true, we'd also have to run another line of code to skip past the else. That one extra line of code means that a true has extra time associated with it. The else, on the other hand, which would be at the bottom, when it finishes running, it just falls through to the code after the, the big if statement. Uh, and so it has kind of an advantage because from the control flow perspective, it would have fewer total instructions. So we want to reverse that. And so when we implement ifs that have else's in assembly language, we put whatever is going to happen with the greatest probability at the bottom of the control structure. That way we can do the comparison and the conditional branch regardless of whether it's true or false. And if it is true, it's going to jump down to our true code block. And when that's done running, it doesn't have to jump out of it. It can just fall through and continue, which means it's faster. All right, so we're going to see that here on the right. Let's look at how this goes. We're going to grab dog into A, and we'll grab cat into B and do the subtraction, just like we've seen before. Now we have a different condition, not less than. We're looking for not equals. So in this case, since our true code, where the dog is not equal to the cat, is at the bottom, we're going to have to branch down there when the condition of not equal is true. So when they're not equal, branch down to here. In which case, what we're going to have to do is decrement cat. Now there is a decrement instruction which will be fast for us to use, but it only works on register A and dog is in register A. So what we're going to do is swap register A and register B. I could just register copy uh, from register B into register A, but that would clobber, clobber my only copy of dog. And just in case I might need to use it in some later code, I'm going to go ahead and leave that copy around. That way I don't have to do another memory access, which will be slow. So I swap instead of clobber. So we swap so that A now contains cat and B contains dog. I can decrement A, which decrements the value of cat, and then I can store that new value back into the cat variable and move on with life. Now, if it turns out dog is equal to cat, then this conditional branch will fail, and so we'll just fall down to the next line of code. We'll again swap so that I can get uh, cat into the A register, 
uh, and um, get dog into the B register, but this time it's for different reasons. When I want to add 5, I need to get 5 into one of those registers, A and B. And so if cat is in, um, if, I'm sorry, if dog is uh, in the A register, the only way I can get 5 into one of those is by setting A to 5. So I'd lose dog. So I swap to get dog over in B. Then I can put a 5 into the A register. Then I can add, and it doesn't matter whether the 5 or the dog is on the left, right? So we add, and now I get dog plus 5. And I can store that value that's now in register C into the memory location for cat. And then here's that part that makes the else really a little bit more inefficient. I don't want to then run this true code again, so I can't just fall straight into it. I've got to skip over it. So I have an unconditional branch down to my label that's called done, and I'm over here. Now, uh, that's the basics of this control flow, but there's still more that we could do to make this code better. Now, this is not something we can always do. It's just a coincidence based on this particular code. In both the true and false parts, uh, or the, uh, the, the, the main if and the else part of this C code, cat, the variable, is getting updated. Uh, and by, because of that, at the end of both uh, the else stuff and the uh, true stuff, we have to store the result that's in register C back into cat. So instead of having two lines of code that are duplicates of one another, we could actually pull this store out of both sections and put it after the done label. Because no matter whether we do the, the true part or the false part, we have to update the cat variable based on what's in register C at that moment. And so that would uh, give us uh, a shorter program. And a shorter program means a smaller program in bytes, which could mean that it's faster to load into memory to start executing. So that's something to consider. Another thing that would do the same thing is because of the nature of these uh, particular instructions, both of our true and false parts start by swapping the A and B register. So what we could actually do uh, is pull the swap out of those two entirely. Uh, in fact, uh, if we were really clever, we would have loaded dog into B, loaded cat into A, then done, done this subtraction and conditional branch, and never done a swap uh, at all. It wouldn't even affect the condition of our branch, uh, whether we switch, whether cat or dog is on the left or the right, because we're not looking for a relational one like less than or greater than. We're just looking for whether they're equal or not. If they are equal, the subtraction will be, the result of the subtraction will be zero, regardless of um, which was bigger. Uh, well, it, neither would be bigger <laughs> if the result was zero, but it would, regardless of which side of the ALU they were on. Right? So we could also do that to improve this code. What about a multi-condition if statement? This one, again, I'll, I'll show two different ways to do this. So here we have a real fancy condition. Uh, if A is greater than B, or uh, B mod 2 equals 0, uh, then we're going to set X some variable to 4. Now these A and B, we're going to just assume that these are the registers A and B, which of course we wouldn't write in C code, but it's just something I did to make the uh, code on the right a little shorter. Uh, now A greater than B, that's easy to understand. But this code here, whether B mod 2 is equal to 0, that's pretty standard code for determining whether or not b is an even number. So if you modulus it by 2 and the, the remainder is 0, then b is even. If you modulus it by 2 and you don't get 0, meaning you get 1, then b must have been an odd number. And that's true whether it's negative or positive. So that's really what we're going to be looking at, is b even. Now because we're using an or condition here, uh, or an or to bind these two conditions, uh, we must remember how OR shortcuts. AND works a different way, but it has a shortcut too. With OR, if the left side is true, then we're not going to bother evaluating the right side. We're just going to go ahead and run the true code. If uh, the left side is false and the right side is false, that's the only time we're going to skip past 
the uh, code for setting X to 4. So we've got to make all that happen in the assembly. Uh, since I've got a, registers A and B permanently existing, I don't have to load them here. I'll just do the subtraction for comparison. Notice that I'm doing a branch greater than. That's actually what this condition is over here. So we have to be thoughtful when we write these conditions. Sometimes we use negative or inverted logic, and sometimes we don't. In this case, I'm not. So I'm saying if A is greater than B, then branch down to the true code. That's really doing the shortcut. I'm skipping the right-handed condition. But if it's not, then that means A must be less than or equal to B. And so then we've got to check to see whether B is even. So to do this, uh, I don't have a modulus instruction or even a division instruction. And I could synthesize it with iterative uh, subtraction and comparisons in a loop, but I don't want to do that either. And because uh, checking for things to be even is so common, uh, there are nice shortcuts that we can use. In particular, we can just use a bit mask. Uh, if we uh, turn off all the bits in the value b except the lowest ordered bit, then we'll be left with either all zeros and the number was even, or we'll be left with uh, the bit pattern for a positive 1, all zeros that ended 1. And that means it's an odd number. That's equivalent to the remainder. We'll get a 0 or we'll get a 1. So I'm going to do this by setting register A to contain a bit mask. Uh, and this bit mask I put in binary. So just like you might see 0x and then some hex value, in SPU assembler we can write binary numbers. So we can put 0b and then some pattern of 1s and zeros. And if you want, you can indu introduce underscores to visually group together bits. Uh, by habit, I just put an underscore right after the B um, because the B kind of looks like an odd mix of a 1 and a 0, and it visually messes things up for me. So uh, here I've put a whole nibble. All that really matters is the 1, but I want to make sure that I'm mentally seeing that this is the bit string uh, with a bunch of zeros in the front and a 1 at the end, and not I'm doing the number 1 because I might be adding 1 or doing something like that. I want to make it very clear that this is masking that's going to be happening. So I have a bit string uh, with a 1 at the end and all zeros. And then I can AND the A register, which has the bit mask, with the B register, which is the thing I'm checking to see whether or not it's even. When I'm done with this, I get a result in the C register. That result will either be a 0 or a 1 based on whether this thing was even or not even. And uh, if the result is zero, the zero flag would be set. And if the zero flag um, is set, then we want to run the true code. So what I'm going to do is branch on the zero flag not being set down to done, because that means the left condition failed and the right condition failed. So I skip past the x equals. Otherwise, I fall down in here into the true code. I'll set a to 4, and then store that value from a, it's 4, into the memory location for the variable x. And that completes that code on the left. Now, we are just trying to check to see if b was even, and we can do this in another way. Let me go back real quick. Notice that the way I did it over here uh, has uh, these three lines of code associated with it. When I come over here to this other way, I can do this in two lines of code, but it may not be another, the thing that you think of first, so sometimes we have to consider alternates. In this case, I'm just trying to isolate that low order bit, the same as I did with the AND bit masking. Right? But uh, what I can do is assigned shift to the right, uh, because all of our shifts are signed in SPU, I can just do a shift to the right, and that's the same as a mathematical division by 2. Now that means that I'll get a result uh, in uh, register C that is the quotient from the division, and we need to do modulus, which is the remainder, but since we're looking for a single bit remainder, that will turn out to be the bit that was just shifted off, which goes into the carry bit in the SPU architecture. So now, after shifting right once, I can actually do a branch. If the carry bit is set, then that means uh, the 
The remainder was one, and this thing was odd. And so I skipped past the true code, and we're done. If the carry code wasn't, if the carry flag wasn't set, then this conditional branch fails, and I fall down into the same old true that we have before. So it's two different ways to check to see if that number is even, and one of them is one instruction shorter, which probably means it's faster. All right, looping, a do loop. This is a loop where we know that we're going to run one iteration of it at least, and then we consider whether or not we should run any more. Uh, so here is just a do loop. Uh, doesn't do anything fabulous, but in the do loop, we're going to multiply a variable x uh, by 3. Uh, and we're going to keep doing that as long as x is less than or equal to 400. And we're definitely going to do it at least once. Uh, so x could already be greater than 400, and that doesn't matter to us. We're going to do this at least once, because that's what that code says to do. All right, so... The first thing we're going to do is load the variable x into the b register. Now, you might say, why didn't I load it into the a register? Well, when I have to compare the value of x uh, to 400 at some other point, I'm going to have to use subtraction to do it. Uh, but there's only way, one way to get 400 into either the a or the b register, and that's to start by putting it in the a register with the set a function. If I wanted it in B for some reason, I would have to set A to 400 and then either swap the registers or do a register copy from A to B. Uh, keeping all this in mind, I cleverly uh, put the value of X into the B register uh, so that when I set A to 400, I'll then have my two values, X and 400, already in the two main registers. So I put it in B. Uh, after it's there, I start my loop. The first thing I do is make a copy of that thing uh, into A. The only reason that I'm going to do that is because now I have two copies of X. So I've got X uh, here and I've got X here. If I were to add them, I'd have two X. But one of them is in register A, and register A can be shifted to do multiplication or division by two. So what I'm going to do is left shift register A once, which is the same as multiplying by 2. So now I'm going to have in the B register the original value of X, and in the A register, well, calculated from the A register, I'm going to have 2X. So I'll bring that back up to A. See that here in the register copy from C back to B. Uh, and um, what? Oh, this code is wrong. <laughs> I've got the right idea, but the code is wrong. Uh, so I shift left A. Now I've got B is 1x. A still is 1x, and C is 2x. I've got to get that back up. So uh, let, let me modify this code. My slide is going to look funky for a second. Uh, after, after I've done this, <laughs> let's uh, bring the value in register C back up to register A. Uh, so that is register copy. And we're going to make our destination be register A. And our source is going to be register C. And so now A is going to contain um, 2x. This comment up here is incorrect. Uh, A just is regular old x. Let's delete that all together. So a is now 2x and b is regular x. I've got to modify this malarkey too now. Oh, can I get them? Hey, everything looks great. Nobody's the wiser. <laughs> okay, so I've shifted left the A register once. I've got 2x in A after I copy the result of that shift back up. So I've got 2x and x. If I add them together, I've got 3 times x. So I add. Now C contains 3 times x. And if I bring a copy of C back up into register B, B will also have 3 times x. Then 
I can set A to 400 uh, and check whether or not what the relationship is between the 400 and the 3x or the new version of x. Please note, I don't actually modify x here yet. I've just got a copy of 3x in a register. But really all that matters is x is modified by the time we're done with the while loop. So I'm being a little sneaky here. So uh, I set a to 400, do the subtraction. But a is 400 and b is the updated version of x. And this code says is x less than or equal to 400. So I have to reconsider because of the left-right orientation change here. What I'm really looking for is whether 400, which is now in A, on the left of my ALU, is 400 greater than or equal to X, the thing on the right. So if it is, then I'm going to branch back up here to the beginning of my do loop and continue running again, and continue that process over again. Uh, and note that because I put 3x here into B, when I get here, my new register B contents is really 3x, not the original x. At some point, however, this will fail, and we'll actually have a value in x that's greater than 400, in which case we don't do this conditional. The conditional branch fails, and we'll fall through. Uh, over here, that would mean we were done. But in this assembly code, what we're going to finally do is take our final result of multiplying x uh, by itself three times over and over and over again um, and store that back into the actual variable x so that we have the equivalent effect of this code over here. All right, a while loop. So a while loop is actually the same thing as a for loop uh, in uh, when you get down to assembly language. If the uh, before the while loop you initialize the sentinel. Now, it's definitely, however you code a while loop, the condition of it is going to involve variables that have been set somewhere. So for the sake of it, the code I'm going to write, and I did this here in the left in the C code, looks like what a for loop would be if you expand it. So think of a for loop that, create, that uses a brand new variable i starting at zero and loops 20 times as long as i is less than 20, incrementing i at the end of each loop iteration, and in the middle doing some stuff. Now I'm not going to write all the code for doing stuff in this case because we've got enough code that just does a while loop to look at. So let's take a peek here. First thing I'm going to do, since this is all based on some temporary variable, I'm just going to assume that I can use a register for it and not really have to deal with a variable called i. That's some, something a compiler might do, is never create a variable in memory for something that's short-lived. So we'll put 20 directly into register A, and then I'll swap it out over into the B register, uh, and then uh, set A to 0. So 20, which is the stop condition of our loop, is going to go over to B. 0 is going to go into register A and stay in register A, and that way I can take register A subtract b from it, uh, and then I'll keep that value of 20 and b constantly, incrementing register a until finally they're uh, equal to one another or a is greater than 20. Right? Of course, it'll stop when they're equal. Uh, so that sets us up. That rhymes our loop. Then we go into the loop proper, and with a while loop, we check the condition at the top, not the bottom. So we do a subtraction which will take 0 minus 20 in this case, and we check to see is 0 greater than or equal to 20. Uh, if it is, then that means the condition over here that should keep us in the loop uh, has failed, and so we need to skip past the loop contents. So over here, we're kind of doing the opposite logic again. Uh, we want to conditionally branch past everything, uh, and if that inverted logic fails, then we'll fall into the loop and run its internals and loop again. So uh, we'll branch on greater than or equal to done. And if that doesn't hold, we must still need to do the loop. So we come down in, we increment, we do stuff, whatever that is. 
then we increment a, which is our uh, register concept of the variable i, and then jump back up to the top of the loop unconditionally, at which point we'll do another subtraction for comparison uh, and potentially get ourselves out of the loop in the end. And that's all there is to it for making a while loop. You'll notice it looks a lot like an if that doesn't have an else in the way it's structured. Uh, and it really is. It's just that when you get to the bottom of the true part of the if, uh, we branch back up unconditionally to the top. All right. Our last piece of control flow that we're going to look at is uh, that of a very simple function, one that uh, takes um, a single argument and then manipulates it uh, before it returns. So here on the left, what I've got is the C code for some function called add7. Man, this is a lame function. All it does is take a pointer to some variable, uh, and then it increments the variable at that address by 7. It adds 7 to it. That's it, and then it returns. Now, you may not be used to, in your C code, uh, putting in a return instruction if the return of the function is void, uh, but that's perfectly legal, and it's part of um, my coding standard to make every function have a return, whether it returns a value or not. Uh, that way I can visually uh, see when I'm sort of mucking something up or, or out of sorts. So I just put it there. So let's look at the implementation of the function first. Um, we want to consider the fact that we don't know where this is being called from. We don't know what registers have what values that are being used by whomever is calling us. So we have to take some care. The very first thing we're going to going to pay attention to is whoever calls us needs to follow some rules to get that parameter to us, right? Uh, and since we need a pointer, we're going to say we expect the address register to already contain a pointer to our local variable x. Um, now in our assembly code we don't have x, uh, but that's referring to this C code. To have the beginning of the function, we just need a label. That's it. Uh, then the very first thing we have to do is take into consideration that other code that's called us might be using some registers, right? We sure have used a lot of registers so far, so there's no reason to expect otherwise. My code ends up using, for this add 7, registers A, B, and C for parts of the calculation. It clobbers whatever was there. So that means I need to back them up and restore them as a part of this function call. So I'm just going to push them right to the stack, wherever the stack points to. I don't care. So I push A, then I push B, then I push C. Then I do a bunch of stuff that adds 7, and it's not much. But when I'm done with that, I need to do the opposite of backing up the registers. I need to restore them. Uh, and because I'm using a stack structure to do it, I have to restore them in the opposite order. So I pushed A, pushed B, and then pushed C. When I get done with this function, but before I return, I'll pop into the C register from the stack, then pop into the B register, and then pop into the A register. And that's this code here. All right, so in between that, I add 7 to the variable pointed to by AR. Let's see that code. Uh, I set A to 7. Uh, and, oh, no, before I add A to 7, where, where did the value of X go? Uh, so I load using the pointer in the AR register into the B register. Then I put a 7 into the A register. So I've got X over here in B and 7 over here in A. Then I add them together, and now C, that's all three of my registers clobbered, contains the sum of X and 7. So after the add, I can store using the same address in the AR register, because I didn't touch that register. I can store that result from C back to that address, and the original variable is modified. I restore my used registers, and then I use the return instruction. Uh, if you go back to the SPU uh, overview slides and look at that documentation on your own, uh, you'll recall exactly how that return works. It's actually going to be popping the return address of the code that called us, or the, the code after the code that called us, it'll pop that right off of the stack into the program counter so that the next thing that runs is the code uh, right after the code that called us. So, 
Now let's look at an example of how you would call this function in assembly language. That's over here on the right. So in this case, I'm just uh, doing some very simple thing. Uh, what I'm going to do is put the letter 0, the character 0, uh, into the equivalent of our register x. So I'm going to send a reference to it eventually. Uh, and I'm going to use a variable called q to do it. Uh, but what it will do is we'll print this variable q out, and that'll be the, the letter 0. Then we'll add 7, which will give us the letter 7, and we'll print that out. Uh, and so we should see the result being a 0 followed by a 7 on the terminal for output. That's a way this could be used. So I put the character 0 into the A register, and then store that value into uh, the memory location for my favorite variable here, q, whatever variable you like. Once I've got that in place, I need to call the add7 function, because goodness knows I couldn't add it any other way without calling this ridiculous function. But I need to get the AR register to contain the address of my variable q. So to do that, I have to first put into the A register the address of q, and then uh, move that from A over into the AR register. Well, it's not a move, it's a copy. So copy it into AR. So AR is a reference to Q at this point. Then I use the call instruction to back up the address of the line of code after me, which is this system call, onto the stack, and then jump immediately to this label for add 7. That's going to run here, back up our registers, add 7 to my variable Q, restore the registers, and then return back to the line of code after the call, which will be here. So the variable Q doesn't contain the letter 0 anymore. It contains the letter 7. I think before I said I was printing out both, I'm realizing this code only prints out the result. So we should see a character 7. So when I call the system call function 0, that is the output function and takes the character pointed to by the address register, which points to Q. Uh, and prints it to the terminal. So that should, at this point, be the letter 7. So there you have it. That's all of the major control flow uh, structures in uh, our SPU assembler. And while there are certainly more, we didn't look at multi-conditions that include and, or multi-conditions that have combinations of ors and ands, uh, or if, else ifs, elses, but you should see a pattern in that assembly code. If uh, you've been paying attention, what you've noticed is the way we wrote the original if statement that had no else and the way we wrote the if statement that had an else are basically the coding structures for everything. All the loops work the same way as those, uh, except that occasionally you jump backwards uh, instead of forwards. The only thing that's structurally really different from that at all is dealing with the functions. Uh, but they're not particularly complicated either, uh, so long as the function's uh, parameter list and so on is not complicated either. If you've got any questions, please leave some comments below uh, and uh, let me know what you think.